Now we're going to turn to one of my favorite things, disruptive technology. We love the, talking about that here on ETF Edge. Let's end with one of our favorite areas, space exploration. We just had World Space Week. There's lots of news there lately. So who better to discuss it? Andrew Chain, and he's CEO of Procure, uh, who runs the Procure Space ETF. The, singer, the, the ticker, excuse me, is UFO. <laughs> Andrew, we got news recently from Boeing and Virgin Galactic, as well as SpaceX. Bring us up to date. We had the head of NASA on an hour or so ago talking about it. Exciting times for space. Yeah, so we just wrapped up uh, World Space Week, which took place from the 4th to the 10th of October. People from all over the world really realizing how important space is, not just for any one individual, any one company, or any one government. This is a truly global collaborative industry. And what we're seeing is still this transformation away from it being completely reliant upon government agencies like NASA, like Roscosmos, like the ESA and it being driven by commercial interests now. So the governments out there are saying, hey, we want to play ball, we want to work with you, come up with your solutions, and we're happy to finance that. But so much of the spending now is coming from outside the government, which is a really exciting time for the industry. We had the head of NASA on saying SpaceX and Boeing could fly astronauts in 2020. He was quite bullish. He's a very good seller for space in general. But uh, what I was impressed by his comments were, we are responsible to the American people as NASA, and it's good business sense for us to farm out, essentially, subcontract to SpaceX, subcontract uh, to NASA as well, uh, subcontract to Boeing as well. Uh, SpaceX has made tremendous strides in gaining the confidence of, of NASA. They have, and I think one of the things that most people don't give the government or NASA enough credit with is how valuable $1 of spending from NASA is. It's come out in various reports showing that $1 that NASA spends actually shows 8 to $10 in, in growth. So yeah. this money being spent by NASA isn't just for, you know, okay, we want to be able to say we're great. We're actually being able to take those technologies and where yeah. that money's getting spent and turn that into a positive for the overall economy. And one story I really like is just, it's sort of like DARPA, how many great technologies came out of DARPA, like the internet. How many great technologies came out of uh, NASA, for example, uh, that, that have been out there, broadband and other uh, space technologies that we now use here on Earth? So the military also is using GPS. That's a, a major one that you can't do without satellites. And that's now something that is in everyone's cell phone to get your hail your ride app or so your delivery food gets to your place on time. That's just one of the uses. You think about weather and things like that. And you look at you know, surveillance and intelligence services. Satellites are being used for that, but there's so many other industries that are also relying upon space. Now, we put up your space ETFs. I want to get the guys in here, but I would, I would note, if you look at the biggest holdings here, you, you own mostly satellite companies. You have a rather complicated way for determining what goes into that, that, that ETF, but obviously you own things like Intelsat, Loral, Utelsat. These are all satellite companies, essentially. They are, and actually, I think that's what it makes this such an important fund because you're not getting these same exposures in other funds. So you might be getting more diversified aerospace technology, but this is something different. I love the satellite companies. I got to tell you, we, you know, Andrew and I have known each other for quite some time, and we talked about the UFO as it came to market. What's incredible is their knowledge of, of the space industry. And what struck me as a consumer, as someone who's just learning about it for the first time, was that satellite story in and of itself. There's only a finite amount of satellite yeah. space above this planet. Yeah. And so as these companies that you're looking at that are in this ETF vie for control of where to put those satellites with, not only amongst themselves in the U.S., but globally with other countries, Countries, it's a really interesting story about that, the cost of doing that and the value associated with having a satellite in orbit that can do some of the things that Andrew alluded to. So we've had some of our forward thinkers saying, well, basically, we're going to have uh, internet service all over the world now, thanks to these satellites. What, what, give us some idea of what spacey technologies may come out of NASA in the next five, six, seven, eight years, well, about our investment in space. So NASA's doing so much, and if you saw their earlier uh, news release over the summer, they're saying that the International Space Station is now open for business. And we're going to be able to have American companies fly U.S. astronauts back to space again, which hasn't really been something that we've been doing over the, the last decade plus. So we're seeing America's place in space starting to change. We're also seeing tons of interest from around the world. China has aspirations, Russia has aspirations, India, Canada, and so on. So the ideas, the technologies, where, where the winners are going to be, it's tough to say, but certainly having a contract from NASA saying, okay, we want to you know, fund you to get to a certain point is certainly helpful for and the And Virgin Atlantic and, uh, and Musk, uh, uh, SpaceX, want to put people on the moon again for mining purposes. Uh, Musk has been talking about getting uh, people on, onto a Mars 
base within the next few years. It's, it's percolating back. It's amazing what private entrepreneurs have done to revive the space concept. And I think one of the things that is actually going to help humans be able to advance faster and further is the, the reliance on technology. So things like 3D printing and autonomous vehicles, those can all be used in space and not having to risk human life while actually testing and maybe building a habitable area on Mars or the moon could all be built robotically from afar so that when we're ready to go there, we can enter and everything's been built and made for us. And I think what you have with the long-term investment theme oriented products is you have to understand how it fits in and what is inside the portfolio. We showed the holdings earlier, but those are not necessarily companies people would think are going to be the winners in the future. It's a guess as to what might be and what might not be when you look inside the portfolio. It really is a representation of the global publicly traded uh, space industry. So 30 plus companies from around the world with different, different specialties, satellite manufacturing and operation, rocket manufacturing, as well as working on some of these futuristic technologies. But like you said, this industry will likely change over the years. The index provider is aware of that. So they're already looking for companies that are going to be doing things in the, the militarization of space in more space tra transportation and hospitality as well as infrastructure building. And then there's the Moonshot projects. I know my friend Peter Diamandis is um, working on a, a company that will mine asteroids uh, uh, out there and pulling uh, minerals off of asteroids. Uh, it's all sorts of amazing technologies that are available right now. It's fantastic. I think XPRIZE and Peter Diamandis yeah. and, and others are doing some incredible things to not just help allow for technologies to make it to market, but really inspiring people from around the world, getting them excited about space so the next wave of entrepreneurs and students are studying these futuristic technologies and maybe they'll be our solution providers. And maybe they'll be sitting there watching, saying, just like I did when I was 13 years old in 1969, and they landed on the moon. Gee, I'd like to follow that. I think it's a great future. Let's hope the new kids are watching what's going on now and they're equally inspired. Thanks for bringing us up to date.